And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Now, that's interesting to me that he says that out loud because he wants Abraham to hear it. You know, it's kind of like uh, if you want to buy a Christmas gift for your kids, you don't tell them unless you want them to know. I wonder what I should give my kids in their hearing for Christmas. Oh, and they'll tell you what they want. You know, you, you're kind of letting them in on the secret. So um, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, um, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Then the man turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. And the last scripture we're going to look at is in verse 33. And uh, what, what you need to know that happens in between is Abraham starts interceding for the people of the city. He starts out, if there's 50 righteous, are you going to destroy it? No, 45, no, 30. And he goes down until he gets to 10. And then he said, uh, uh, you know, and the Lord said, I will not destroy it if there are 10. And then in verse 33, it says, as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. Now, it's interesting to me that Abraham was doing all the talking, but the Bible says when the Lord had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed. So it's like God initiated the conversation. Even though Abraham is talking, God is guiding this conversation. It's exactly what he wants to see happen. The point of what I'm going to look at today is we're going to go back to focus on the scripture in verse 19. For I have chosen him, Abraham, that he, can, he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. How do you keep the way of the Lord? By doing righteousness and justice so the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Now, how many of y'all want to see the promises of the Lord take place in your life? Right? I still think the key to that is that we learn how to function in righteousness and justice. Now, righteousness and justice are big terms, they're legal terms, we're like, man, I don't know what that means. But if you're, if you're walking in righteousness and justice, which I'm going to break down for you here in a minute, then that is the key to walking in the way of the Lord. So I want you to notice that God is initiating the conversation with Abraham and he lets us know his purpose in doing so, so that Abraham may keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Now, I believe that what plays out next is basically a living example of what righteousness and justice, God's way, looks like. For, so before we do that, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is righteousness? Very simple way of thinking about it, that which is right in the eyes of God. Now, the Bible says that we took on Jesus' righteousness. Jesus was right in the eyes of God. We were not because we were sinners. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's standards, God's way, God's righteousness. But Jesus gave us his righteousness. So we can be righteous positionally because what Jesus did for us in life. But righteousness is also doing those things that are right in the eyes of God. You can be a righteous person and not do righteous things. Do you know that? You know, there are Christians all the time. We get saved, and you're learning how to walk before the Lord, and some of those old ways, you know, kind of sneak up on you while you're living your life. I know a guy that was a Christian, but he, he kept cussing. You know, he just kept doing that. And, you know, over a process of time, that righteousness that God, you know, made you to be righteous should begin to work its way out of you so that not only what you you're, you're not only righteousness positionally, you stand before the Lord because of what Christ has done, but your life begins to bear the fruit of righteousness, which means your life looks like Jesus. It's you start to do the things that Jesus did. You start to live the way that God wants you to live. So righteousness can be positional and can also be the things that we do. Now, what is justice? Well, basically, justice is righteousness working its way out among people. Okay? See, Justice, righteousness is more of a vertical thing. I'm righteous with the Lord. I walk before the Lord. Justice is when you do the right things among the people. When God's justice begins to work itself out among the people. And God wants justice or his ways to be, to be evident 
not just uh, within a person, but also between people. We see that in the New Testament. Paul says, uh, you know, speak, uh, let your, uh, you know, speak well with one another. Don't criticize one another. Don't complain against one another. Don't see what's happening. You want God's ways to work out between the relationships that we have in the church, and you also want God's ways to work out between the relationships that we have with the people outside the church. Amen? Our neighbors, you know, you, so we have righteousness, which is God's way, vertical and justice, which is God's way, it, it, you know, uh, God's way working itself out among society. So you might say one is vertical in its dimension and the other is horizontal. It's all righteousness, but when it's applied to, to social relationships, it's called justice. God's desire is that Abraham, for Abraham, is that he would teach his children these things, which are his ways, and to do that, Abraham is given the opportunity to display what he is now or will now be charged with teaching righteousness and justice. In other words, God doesn't just want it to be a knowledge. He wants Abraham to be a doer of the word, not just a knower of the word. We live in a society where if you know the word, you're considered to be a doer of the word, but biblically, until you're a doer of the word, you don't know the word. It's just the way it works out. Now, in Psalms 103, verse 6, the Bible says, the Lord performs righteous deeds and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. What are his ways? To perform righteous deeds and justice for all who are oppressed. What did that look like for Moses? God used him to set the Israelites who were oppressed in slavery in Egypt free from bondage. You might say that's what his ways, righteousness and justice, look like. God revealed to Moses he wanted to deliver the people from Egypt because they were in slavery and they were oppressed, and they were oppressed in Egypt. So what does righteousness and justice look like? God coming in through Moses and delivering people from slavery. Does that make sense? Right? Looking at this from the opposite side, Proverbs 13.23 says that fallow, which means uncultivated ground, the fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice or through a lack of justice. So we can learn from that scripture that justice is some way is somehow uh, done when you help give people and uh, you help people's land and give their land an opportunity to produce. So we might say if we understand that people's land is uncultivated, it doesn't produce, they don't have uh, food, they don't have opportunity to make money. Why is that happening? Because of injustice. So when you allow somebody's land and you help somebody to be able to produce on their land, to be able to cultivate their land, to be able to help their land grow, then you're actually uh, implementing justice. Now here's the thing, in the Bible, land can also be a metaphor for lives, for people's lives. So justice is helping God's people or helping people in general to become productive in their life, to help them to produce, to help them to become, our, our, our vision here or our mission, I'm not sure which one it is, is to discover, to develop, and to deploy people into their divine destiny to help people find their divine destiny in life and to help them to find and follow after God's will for their life so that their lives can be fruitful. You know God wants your life to be fruitful? Right? Did you know what he said in the beginning? Be fruitful and multiply. Now, a lot of times we think being fruitful is have a lot of kids. No, that's where multiply comes in. Right? Why would he say be fruitful and multiply? Because he wants us to produce fruit. He wants us to produce fruit. Blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the instruction of the Lord, and in his instruction he will meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. They shall bring forth fruit in their season. Their leaves shall not wither, and whatever they do shall prosper. Now, how many of y'all want to prosper in life? Right? Prosperity is not a bad word. How many of you know prosperity is not a bad word? I want to prosper in life. 
right? I'd like to have money as well, but money and prosperity are not always equal. We tend to think that money and prosperity are synonyms, but they're not. Your life can prosper by becoming everything God wants you to be, but you may not necessarily have a lot of money. Let me give you the example. In Solomon's day, there were silver pe people that had silver mines, and they were silver workers, and they were producing, so their land was prospering, right? The only problem was nobody wanted silver. So you can prosper, but nobody want what you have. But it doesn't mean that you're not prospering. God wants you to prosper regardless of whether you have money or not. God wants you to prosper. Some of you have gifts, talents, abilities, creative talents. Some of you have purposes that God's destined you for, careers that he's, he's leading you into. It could be governmental positions, educational positions. He has all these things that he has for you in life. And in order to do that, you have to prosper, right? Prospering with God is becoming everything he wants you to be, not always making a lot of money. Now, it's nice when you can prosper and make money. We're not against you making money. We would love for you to make money, but that's not necessarily equated with prospering. What I would love for you to do is to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers because that's what John prayed in the book of uh, Third John, right? I want my soul to prosper, right? I want to be in health. I do. I'd also like to have a little bit of money. Right? Now, if I got to choose one, I'm going to choose soul and health over money, but money doesn't hurt. Okay? Just so you understand, prosperity and money are not always equated. Jeremiah was extremely prosperous because he had the word of the Lord, he delivered the word of the Lord, but he was not a wealthy guy because nobody wanted what he had. Am I making sense to you? Okay, so that's the difference. But anyway, so what is uh, God's way to perform righteousness and justice for all, for all those who are oppressed? Now, why is this important? Because God is teaching Abraham his nature and his ways. See, I didn't forget about Abraham. God allows Abraham to intercede for the city that is under scrutiny because that's God's nature. It's not his will that any should perish. And by initiating this conversation, and you have to understand, Abraham didn't start the conversation. God did. Should we tell Abraham what we're going to do? And Abraham's standing right there. Who initiated the conversation? Abraham's ears picked up. What are you going to tell me? Uh, what is it that's going to happen? And then God tells him, what, what, well, we've heard that some bad stuff's going down in the city. Now, do you think God needed to tell Abraham, we've heard, and I've got to go check it out? No, he already knew. God knows everything. So why is he doing this? Because he wants to teach Abraham his ways, which is righteousness and justice, and he gives Abraham an opportunity to be able to live out, not just know it up here. So God initiates the conversation. God allows Abraham to intercede for the city, and it's not his will that any should perish. And by initiating this conversation with Abraham uh, and Abraham interceding for the city, he is cementing the ways of God into Abraham, into his outlook, into his soul, into his nature, because God's nature and desire, his way, is to spare, to deliver those that are oppressed, not to destroy. This is Old Testament. Listen to me. A lot of th people think, well, that's Old Testament. God was not like that in the Old Testament. He's only like that in the New Testament. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not want to destroy the wicked. In the book of Ezekiel, turn from your wicked ways. I don't want anybody to perish. Jeremiah 33, I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare, for your future, right? Not to harm you. That's not God's way. Listen, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves people. Now, he's also righteous. He's a righteous judge. He's got to deal with stuff. Listen, I have, I have two kids, and my, they're all grown up now, but the bottom line is I want them to grow up righteously, and I, I show mercy and compassion, but every once in a while, I got to, I got to, I got to take out the rod right? But it do, I don't do it because I'm upset with them. I shouldn't. I do it because I love them. Because if I don't correct them, then they'll continue in the behavior that they're going on. And that's worse for them than, than me taking out the rod. Now, you know, that's a metaphor for discipline, right? So sometimes God 
has to discipline us because we reap what we sow, and if he doesn't do that, then, and then, it, then, the, then the whole the city, nation, whatever, can go down a course that's really, really not well, but he doesn't do it because he's upset and angry. He does it out of love. Am I making sense to you? This is Old Testament. It's important that you see that. How much more in the New Testament? Psalms 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation. So his throne is set upon the block of well, two blocks. One is righteousness and one is justice. His throne represents the place where he rules and reigns, so we could just as well say that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his kingdom. What do we have to do to enter into the kingdom of God? Be born again. You know what happens when you're born again? You become righteous, right? So what is the foundation of his kingdom? Righteousness and justice. Now, how is us getting born again justice? Because God delivered us from the one that was oppressing us all our lives, which is the devil. Right? So when we got saved, we experienced righteousness and justice, and God delivered us from our oppression. And his kingdom came to bear, and his kingdom was manifest. In, uh, his kingdom is found in the hearts of his people. We are made righteous by the work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He that knew no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what happens when we become the righteousness of God? Same chapter, verse 17, we are new creations in Christ. The old has passed away and the new has come. But for what purpose? Ephesians 4 and 1, so that we may learn to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which we've been called. So God, by an act of his spirit, by a supernatural work of grace, comes into your life, you become a new creation, and you become righteous. Why? So that you can learn how to walk righteously. So you can learn how to live righteously, so that righteousness can be expressed through justice through you. And what does justice do? It gives liberty to the oppressed. It brings the ways of God into the lives of people. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Uh-oh, that's a bad word for a lot of people. We're saved by grace, but why does God save us by grace? So that we can do good works. And you know what those good works are? Righteousness and justice. So, what are these good works called? They're called justice, bringing God's ways to bear into the earth, bringing his justice into the lives of people who are oppressed. It is the presence, if we were to go back you know, to, to the text that we were looking at, we didn't read all of it, but one of the things that Abraham prayed is he said, if there are 50 righteous people, will you destroy the city? And what did God say? No, if there are 50 righteous people, I won't destroy it. If there are 40 righteous people, will you destroy the city? What did God say? No. 35? No. 30? No. 25? No. 20? No. See, a lot of people think that God destroys a city because of wickedness. That's not true. God is actually looking to preserve the city because of righteousness. God is looking to preserve a city because of righteousness. It is the presence of righteous people that preserves the city. Can I tell you something? Your presence in this city is important to not just you, not just your family, but it's important to the city because you preserve the city. Listen to what I'm saying. It is your presence in this place that actually preserves the city from going in a direction that it should not go. You are so important to what God is doing in this place. 
You are vital to the work of God in this place. Psalms, uh, uh, let's see, uh, we are the salt of the earth. You know what salt is? And, and the, you know, we use it for flavoring, but you know what they use salt for back in the New Testament? To preserve meat. They would, they would salt it. And I think if you salt meat, doesn't it become jerky or something like that? Yeah, because it dries it up. We are the salt of the earth. We are the preservative of the earth. We are the light of the world. God puts us here to bring his light, to bring his ways into the city that we live in. God puts us here to bring his ways into the city that we live in. That's important for us to understand. I like to read a text, and I like to go ahead and read the passage in John 17. One seventeen. We want to look at verses 15 through 19. Jesus is about to go to heaven. He's praying to his heavenly Father, and he's praying for the church that he's about to leave behind. He's praying for the apostles. He's praying for the disciples. And this is the prayer he prays. Verse 15. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, even as I am not of the world, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Now, Jesus is praying for his church, and he's saying to them, I don't want you to take them out of the world. I don't want them to be of the world, but I don't want you to take them out of the world because we are the what? The light of the world. Why did Jesus come into the world? The Bible says when Jesus came to the region of, of uh, uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, that the light, a great light shone upon them. Jesus is the light of the world. Where does Jesus live? In our hearts. So now, Jesus is still the light of the world, but he lives in us. He doesn't want us to be taken out of the world because he wants the light of God to light the world just like he came to light the world. We are the light of the world. Now, what basically is Jesus is saying, he said, I don't want my church to be of the world, but I want them to be in the world. What we have to be careful in what we found ourselves doing, and I'm not just talking about this church, I'm talking about the church in general, is we have become more like the world, but we're no longer in the world. In some sense, what's happened is when the leper came to touch Jesus, Jesus was not afraid to touch the leper because Jesus knew that he could make the leper clean. Right? Jesus lives within us, but in some way, the way we're living is, hey, let's not touch the world, because if we touch the world, we're going to become unclean. So what we've done is we've hidden ourselves away in our houses, in our churches, in our temples. We've hidden ourselves away, and we're trying everything we can to keep the world from touching and infecting us so that we don't become like the world. And that is not Jesus' plan at all. What's happening is the more we come out of the world, the more opportunity, unfortunately, the world has to not experience the grace of God like what they experienced through Abraham. And I think in some ways, Christians are not praying anymore for the preserving of the world. They're actually praying for the destruction of the world. Unfortunately, we do not have the heart of God anymore when we are praying that God would destroy the world. God, I want to go to heaven. I want to get out. Everything's going so bad. Oh, God, just come quickly and destroy the sinners of this world. Jesus never prayed that way. Never did. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but he came that the world would be saved. I was trying to remember the scripture where uh, um, James and John were, uh, were, were, Jesus was not accepted into a certain city, and James and John says, do you want us to call down fire from heaven because they wouldn't accept you? And Jesus said, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. In other words, that's not me. That's not my heart. It's not what I want. Right? 
And yet if you look on Facebook, you got all sorts of prophets that are praying that God would just doom the world and condemn the world. But I, I listen, I want Jesus to come back. I'm looking forward for Jesus to coming back. But until he does, I'm supposed to display the nature and the heart and the love of Jesus, which is to care for the world, pray for the world. In fact, one of the things that I did, uh, you know, uh, when all of this stuff was happening, and by the way, I am not a great person. I'm not telling you that you should be like me. I'm not telling you that at all. I'm just telling you I got this revelation because I started thinking about my children. And everybody's saying, oh, the world's going to pot. United States is going, you know, uh, uh, you know, to wear in a handbasket and, you know, and all these things are happening and, you know, it's just going to be bad. And I began to think, wait a minute, my, my children are going to live in this world. I don't want my children to live in a world that's worse than the one that we live in. I, I, don't, I don't want that to happen. And so I started praying. I said, Lord, I, I believe that you're bigger than that. I believe you can change this country. I believe you can change the direction of this country. I pray that this country would not fall under judgment, but this country would experience your mercy and your grace because I want my children to grow up in a place where they can become everything you've called them to be and they don't have to be afraid of getting their heads chopped off. They don't have to be afraid of any of these things that are going on in some of the places of the world, but they can live out their lives in, in faith, believing any way they choose to live for God and have good lives and my children and my grandchildren can have good and that's the way I began to pray and you know what I believe that God is listening to the prayers of those that are praying that because God wants to preserve this country God wants to preserve this world he's not looking to send the world to hell he's looking to save the world and we're we <laughs> We are the people that he uses. We are the instruments that he's placed in this world. Like Jesus represented the Father, he sends us into the world to represent him. We're supposed to take on his nature and the nature of Jesus' is love. Well, Jesus got mad before. The only time Jesus got mad is when it was preventing people from coming to God. Am I making sense to you? That's the only time he got mad is when he was preventing people from coming to God. And really, that should be our heart too, is to make any way possible for people to come to the Lord. Now, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, well, let me say this. Like Jesus, we are sent in the world to bring righteousness and justice to bear. What does it look like for Jesus? Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19, you know the scripture. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What did he do? He sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Remember, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is the foundation of God's throne? Righteousness and justice. So when he's proclaiming what he's preaching and the kingdom of God is at hand, what is he doing? Releasing the captives giving recovery of sight to the blind, uh, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's what it looked like when the kingdom of God manifested through Jesus. The oppressed got set free. The blind could see. The lame could walk. Those who were oppressed were, were set free. The captives were released. That's what justice and righteousness looks like. That's what it looked like in Jesus. Acts 10.38 says it another way. How Jesus of Nazareth was full of the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the enemy. Isn't that awesome? That's what it looked like for Jesus. What does it look like for us? Well, we just need to say, first of all, that we're Abraham's children as well as believers in Christ or sons of God. Because in Galatians 3.29, it says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So like Abraham, we are to intercede for the salvation of our cities. Joyce isn't here today, but Jeanette is. Uh, uh, um, Rosa is, the people that, uh, Linda is, the people that are interceding, and many of y'all are interceding as well. Mary is here. What does it look like for us? Like Abraham, who is supposed to teach his children the ways of the Lord, we are Abraham's children. Like Abraham, we are to intercede for the salvation of our cities. 
If somebody says God's judgment is coming to the city, we don't agree with that. We say, God, no. If there are 50 righteous people in the city, will you spare the city? And I believe God is looking for someone to do that so he can say, yes, I will spare the city. Because I think it's in Ezekiel 22, 20. I, I think it's 22, 20, maybe one of those scriptures. He says, I look for someone to stand in the gap and I could not find one. Is this, is this helping you guys? I know it's righteousness and justice can throw you off. You kind of like, I don't want to listen to that sermon anymore. It's talking about righteousness and justice. But I'm trying to make it easy for you, simple for you. Abraham is just acting out what the ways of God are like to intercede for the salvation of the city. And that's what we're supposed to do. That's what his ways look like. In Matthew chapter 9, 54 through 56, I, I just talked about that before. I, I forgot I had that in here. James and John wanted to call fire down like Elijah, you know, which is Old Testament to consume cities that rejected Jesus. And Jesus, who is the exact representation of the Father, said that they knew not what spirit that was of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save. Like Jesus, we are to help the poor. Poor doesn't always mean someone that doesn't have money. Poor can just mean someone that needs help. We're supposed to help the downtrodden. We're supposed to help the afflicted. We're supposed to help the oppressed, and we're supposed to help those who are distressed. There was somebody that Jesus was talking to that says, love your neighbor as yourself, and the guy says, who is my neighbor? And he talked about, you know, the Good Samaritan. There's a guy that got robbed by bandits and a, and a priest comes along the road and he sees this guy in distress and instead of helping him, what does he do? He goes around him. Now, I believe he's probably thinking to himself, this guy's a Samaritan. He, he could be unclean. I need to keep myself clean. And you know, I think a lot of times if we were honest, maybe we don't help people because we're afraid they're going to touch us and we're going to become unclean. And a Levite came and the same thing happened. We don't know if the guy, but then a Samaritan came who wasn't even part of the people of God. He was, according to the times and the way they understood things at the times he was in, this was a bad word at the time, there was a half-breed, half-Jewish, half, breed, half, Jewish, half uh, some other race, right? And this guy displays what it means to be a neighbor. He took this guy, he helped him, he bandaged him, he took care of him, he made sure that everything was taken care of, and then he came back and he checked on him later. Jesus said, which one of these was a neighbor, the one that helped him go and do likewise? Okay, now, can I just say something? In order for you, uh, if anybody here ever seen a movie called The Hobbit, right? This, this line, there's one line in that movie that really, really impacted me. And that's when he's standing before this lady and he's saying, well, you know, Saruman believes that it's power and it's, uh, you know, might and all these things it takes that to change the world. He said, but I believe it's the little things in life that change the world. Acts of kindness, a word, I'm just going to add this in because this is not what he said, but a word fitly spoken encouraging one another, calling somebody on the phone, checking on how they're doing, bringing somebody a meal that doesn't have one. See, it doesn't have to be big things. Just little things can change somebody's world. A lot of times we don't do little things because we're afraid it's going to require us to do big things. And I want to encourage you not to not do little things because you're afraid it's going to cause you to do something big. Just little acts of kindness. Sometimes giving someone a smile. Sometimes offering a prayer for somebody that's going through something. We say, I'll pray for you. And we go on our way and we forget to pray for them. And just start saying, you know what? I'm not going to go on my way. I'm going to pray for you now. And I want to tell you something. When I've been hurting, it meant so much to me when somebody would just stop right then and pray for me. It, it literally changed my day or my moment. We just don't know how much those little acts of kindness can change people. Just putting an arm around somebody's shoulder and saying, I love you. Listen, I was terrible at this until I started. Anna went through some of the same things that I'm going through now. I didn't realize what she was going through. 
Now that I know what she was going through, all she really, all I needed was somebody to come alongside and just say, you know what, I don't understand what you're going through, but I'm here for you. I love you. We're going to get through this together. Uh, words of hope and encouragement. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can become like Joe's friends, trying to figure out why you're going through what you're going through. You must have sinned. You must have done this. You must have done that. And Job is like, what miserable comforters you are. Right? And that's not really what they need. What they really need is just somebody to come along. Hey, you know what? We're just going to sit with you. I know you don't really want to talk. We're just going to sit with you and just, just be here with you. When I wasn't feeling, at the, a couple of weeks ago, when I was going through some really bad stuff, sometimes people just coming over. I couldn't do it for very long, but just your presence of people, it just made me feel better. Just the spirit of God that was in other people changed the atmosphere, much less just a smile or a word or somebody saying, hey, pastor, how you doing? I feel good for you. And you know what? It's changing me. It's changing me because I used to think in terms of, hey, I need to go do this, but do I have time or whatever? I was thinking in terms of what was convenient for me, not what was important for the other person. And I know I'm just being honest with you because we may all start doing the right things, but if we're not careful, we let those things come in and undermine what God wants to do in our life. The most important thing, can I tell you something? The most important thing that God wants from us is love. And love seeks not his own. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not arrogant. It is not jealous. It is not rude. Does not act unbecomingly. Is not, uh, you know, it's, it's seeking, uh, uh, again, to, for the welfare of others around us. Righteousness and justice is displayed when we learn how to love and I'm going to finish with this. I truly believe that when we get to heaven, God's going to, of course, he's going to say, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. But I believe a lot of rewards are going to go through this filter. How well did you love? You see this act that you did over here? Well, that was a good thing. But why did you do it? Did you do it out of love? You see your wife and your children. You see, I've always had this mentality. I want to change the world. I, I want to go do, you know, all these things. I want to do these big things. I was like that uh, Saruman character and not realizing that God is wanting to know how well did you love your wife? How well did you love your kids? How well did you love the people that I put under your care? How well did you love one another? That's what he's looking for. I used to think it was about uh, direction and it was about disposition. And that disposition is love. When we love, we'll care for the downtrodden, we'll care for the oppressed. And again, I'm not asking you to empty your bank accounts and go spend uh, 35 days with someone that's hurt. I'm just asking you to little acts of kindness. just. Say a kind word to somebody. Somebody looks down, can I pray for you? Hey, and just, I just want to encourage you that things are going to get better. It's not always going to be this way. I know it looks like at the end of the world, but it's not. Hey, I got something to share with you. I feel like the Lord's telling me that, you know what? Weeping may come for the night, but joy is going to come in the morning. We don't have to lie to them. We don't have to tell them if you become a Christian, you'll never have problems. But we can tell them the truth. The truth of the matter is sometimes I look and I think to myself, thank you, God, this is so hard with you. I don't know what I would have done without you. I used to think I was a strong person, but I'm not. But it's okay because when I'm weak, he is strong. And we can give people the opportunity to say, you know what, I don't know what you're going through. I can't believe you're going through that. And I know you're having to go through that alone, but can I tell you something? You don't have to. I know someone who's gone through something with me, and I always felt like I had, when I felt like I couldn't go anymore, somehow or another, he carried me a little bit farther. And I want to offer him to you. Amen? That's what Abraham was doing. So to wrap it up, Abraham's actions were key to the salvation of Lot, and ours are vital for the preservation of those whom God loves and died for. 
So I want to encourage you, have God's heart and have God's nature. God's heart and nature is not to destroy the city. He went out looking for someone who would intercede for the city. And so when the city was destroyed, Abraham also knew something too. It wasn't God's nature. God didn't want to do it. He must have been thinking to himself, the only reason that happened is because there were not ten righteous people. And did he learn something about God? Of course he learned something about God. God didn't want to do it. It had to be so bad that there was no other option. But even in the midst of it, there was only one righteous person, but God delivered him. 